Welcome to the ninth uh, edition of the podcast, the Clown Podcast, that is. I'm Scott Burks. Here I am. And my co-host, Wayne Nash. Please check him out on the yard. That's HBCU Sports. Raps about all things HBCU Sports. It's where a sleazy riddle every Tuesday night on Facebook Live. Please catch him, the coach, and sweet, sweet, sweet Lou. I like saying that. Um, also, please check out his great work. Don't tell him I said that on uh, HeroSports.com. He, he might hear it. He, he might hear. He might, hear it. He might be like, "What the hell?" Um, where he but, but he's also the he's also the brains of the show anyway. But continue. Well, there you go. Hits the sweet, sweet, sweet loop. Um, all love, brother. Uh, so he checks out his great work on HeroSports.com. We talks about FCS athletics as they pertain to HBCUs and me. This website here, The Clown Times, that's the name of my sports blog. Just go to www.theclowntimes.net. You can find me on Facebook as well. So when you're on a smartphone, laptop, desktop, wherever you are, and wherever you may be, you can find me there as well. Just type it in the search window. There I'll be. And there I'll be. And also, please continue to comment, like, subscribe, and share. We pick it up a, some more subscribers as well. So we, we just, yeah, exactly. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you can get notifications of when we have more content, more videos for you to comment on, react to, whatever. So mm-hmm. you can see hitting that subscribe button, and it's a win-win for everybody. Um, and be, like before I say one more thing, well, actually, I'll say it. Also, get this merch too that I pointed up this area. Get that merch. Cafepress.com, search for the Clown Town Sports. The link to that, as well as Dwayne's. Uh, two websites will be in the description end of this video when I upload this puppy to YouTube tomorrow so you can find them there as well. So we'll get a little bit of the football here. Well, a lot of the football. Maybe a football such a podcast for, for all I care. Um, we're going to touch upon what's happening on Black Monday in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Touch a little bit on the playoffs. I think there'll be a bunch of ass whoopers in week one and round one. <laughs> Not so compelling. Also, there was a national championship Monday, and someone finally broke got over the hump. So yeah. we're gonna give Georgia some much of the love, and we're gonna close, close it out on a very important topic in our HBCU sports segment that we've been talking about amongst ourselves for quite a while. It's been on Facebook and other means of social media. Um, and we're going to just bring that to you. So hopefully it'll make you think it's going, it's made me think the last few days. So we're going to get to some NFL. Black Monday. The usual suspects got canned, right? Vic Fangio, Gonzo. Mm-hmm. And Minnesota, they just cleaned house. Both Mike yeah. Zimmer, the head coach, and Rick Spielman, the GM, Gonzo. Um, probably going to start over in Jacksonville, obviously. They have an interim coach. So they got Urban Myers goofy ass the hell out of there earlier. Um, <laughs> Also, let's see. I know I'm missing some. I'm trying to well, say, you got to remember Oakland with their firing. Yes, that's uh, right. Well, uh, the removal of 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 John Gruden. The removal. So, yeah, yeah. Of mm-hmm. course, right. So this has been conversational whether or not they'll keep their interim head coach, who's done a wonderful job right. uh, throughout a lot of the turmoil that they've had to deal with. Yes, they with did. On the field stuff, yes, off the did. field stuff, right. and they were still capable of making the playoffs. So, you know, you got that situation that, that they still may go into a different direction. We still don't know just yet. Exactly. And then Joe Judge, his goofy ass, <laughs> finally got the hell out of town. You know what, though? I feel I feel for the rest of the division rivals. I know you, Eagles fans, especially Cowboys fans, be like, what's wrong with Joe Judge? Why don't you keep him? <laughs> Give him two extra wins every year. Exactly but that right. That's had to exactly go. how I felt it. Right when, when when it was announced yesterday right. of his firing, I was slightly disappointed, but at the same time, <laughs> felt a little vindicated, vindicated because of his whole clown fighting on the sideline comment and then not being mad enough and saying, yeah, I was talking about you, Washington. Yeah. Yes, I'm talking about you, but he's like, no, I was just talking about you. No, we, you know who you're talking about. Stop playing. Right, right, right. You, you make a comment about a team whose key defensive players were fighting on the sideline just a few weeks while you're leading to play them in a couple of days. Come on, man. The coincidence? Uh, I think not, but it is what it is. And but yeah. Go- and his quarterback sneaker from his own end, near his own damn end zone twice. In a row. He's like threw up the white flag. It's like, look, my team sucks. I suck. I want to get fired so I can get this money. <laughs> I was baffled show, and happy at the same time. I'm like, what kind of play calling is this? But hey. Yeah. 
it is what it is, you know. It is I take the it win. Is. It is what yeah. it is. So Judge, Judge, he, I figured he was overwhelmed from the jump. I mean, from his introductory press on, it's like, oh, this was a clown. So it doesn't, it didn't surprise me he lasted only two years. Uh, but the Giants had to do some soul searching because they they've been a complete speaking of clowns, they've been a complete ass mess. The yeah. last how many years? Six, seven, eight, nine years. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a minute, and, and it's interesting that not only did they get rid of Joe Judge, they also got rid of their uh, general manager Gettleman. As yeah, well. Gettleman. He he needed to go a long time ago. I mean, the Panthers fans they're like they literally laughed out loud when they found out that the Giants were hiring Gettleman's ass. I'm like, okay, yeah. you sure about that? <laughs> They probably felt the same way about Washington hiring Ron Rivera, too. Yeah, but I digress. To yeah, yeah, right? So I'm sitting there, but, I mean, they got their own issues with Matt Rule. So, you know. Uh, I'm shocked he's got another home. year. I'm shocked he's got another year. I know he's a college coach. I know they want to give him time. But he's in over his head, man. I mean, first you get rid of Cam Newton. You should have gotten rid of Cam Newton in the first place. So you brought in Teddy Bridgewater, or as a yeah. buddy of mine calls him, Teddy Two Gloves, who wears gloves on both hands. And, you know, that he, for some reason, they decided, oh, this is a good idea to bring in Matt, uh, Sam Donald, who's yeah, still right. seeing ghosts, right? Yeah. Behind a very poor offensive line. Give up all these draft picks to get him. And then Christian McCaffrey, a poor guy, he can't stay healthy to save his life. No. And, you know, I'll tell you what, he, he did a good job on the defense, fixing that defense. Mm-hmm. He did a good job with that. But his, he's a clown show, too. He went through how many offensive coordinators? He's had to revamp his whole of offensive staff because the owner, apparently David Tepper, is making him do so. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's really upset that he gave him such a long contract. It was so much money. But hey, there were other coaches out there, namely uh, Eric Bieniemy, Mike Bieniemy, and mm-hmm. a couple of others. But hey, what do I know? Um, what have I said on this show before about when? Owners and GMs pass up situations that might be better, right? Mm-hmm. You want to go ahead and cut your nose off to spite your face? So be it. You're going to end up right back in the same place you probably were two, three years from now. And in a lot of cases, that's exactly where we are. So all those coaches that pass on Eric enemy, welcome back to Black Monday. Hey, <laughs> it's, been, it's been an exact same few but Sadly, Houston, right? Yeah. And that's a that's a black coach that that unfortunately got got the axe after a year. Uh, 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 another guy that had to deal with a lot of stuff yeah. in Houston. You lose your starting QB. You lose a lot of players. You're deep in the hole. You lose a lot of draft picks. And this is the situation that What's you're currently fault? in. It's from the other it coach. Fault. It's from the and other yes. coach. Yeah. Uh huh. And, and now I, I'm a, I'm gonna be real. I didn't necessarily. Like to hire, but I was thinking, hey, if you want to hire him, at least give him an opportunity, right? Correct. One year later, here we are again. Yeah. So my guess is, what do they go after the guy that they thought they missed out on um, last year and try to bring him in, or, or what? But there's one specific hire, of course, we want to talk about later because there are a couple of more openings that happen too. Mm-hmm. And one of the ones I really want to talk about that shot me, probably shot you, and shot Most a whole lot of people was Brian Flores. Uh, that yeah. really shocked me. I mean, this is a team, I know he's like 24, 25 of all three seasons, but the last two seasons have been winning seasons. Yeah. And the, the, this season, he's, he's won the first game, beat New England on the road, lost seven straight mm-hmm. due to injuries, bad luck, or whatever, and then mm-hmm. comes back and wins seven in a row. So this is the first time that a team in the regular season has lost seven and then won seven. Yeah. That's the first yeah. time it's ever happened. And he was a game or two away from quaff, from possibly pushing for a playoff spot. They finished nine and eight. They beat New England twice. Uh, yeah. They beat New England at the end of the year. And so dude this, he not only swept Belichick this year, he's four and two against. Him. Just about to say that. He's, he's four, four and two against, against He's the only a former assistant who to fare that well against Belichick, but only one of the few coaches to have a winning record against him. Yeah. And he was on his he, that defense of Miami, and look, I know that some of the winning wins and win streak came against like also Rams or whatever, but you can't help who you play, right? Don't matter. Winners are winning this league. Exactly. And it's hard to win in this league. Anyone who uh-huh. follows it knows it's hard as hell to win in this league. Yeah. But he did it. And you know, <laughs> the fact of the matter is that he that his defense 
is damn near elite. Yeah. He just needs, I, I, I think what, well, apparently what the sticker point was, he and another GM, a GM who's also a brother, Chris Greer, which is craziest among all the ironies. Mm -hmm. He lost out, uh, there was a period of power struck, struggle when he heard owner Stephen Ross give the explanation about things not working coherently and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues why I heard was that apparently Flores didn't want tour in the draft. He wanted Herbert. Mm -hmm. He got overruled by the owner and GM. They picked Tua. Herbert went the next next the next pick to the Chargers. Mm -hmm. Right. And we saw how that turned. We see how that turned mm -hmm. out. Turned out. Um, and then apparently Flores also really wanted Deshaun Watson. They had the bevy of picks to get him. One of the mm -hmm. very few teams, not the only team, who had to fire the power power as far as draft picks and maybe a player to do so and not get yeah. seriously hurt, not mm -hmm. mortgage their future. Because they had how many, what, two or three <laughs> like first round picks or three second round picks or whatever? They had a bevy of picks ready. They had a bevy of picks, and you could thank the Houston uh, Texans for that too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Bill exactly. O'Brien. Yeah, and, and and that's another irony in bit of itself. Um, but apparently Greer, again Greer and the owner Stephen Ross, they love Tua. And look, for what I understand, for what I've read and seen, Tua is a good kid. He's a good mm -hmm. young man off the field. He's just not that great on the field. And yeah. the fact that he tries hard, God bless him, tries hard. He doesn't doesn't bullshit around or anything like that. It's just that he's limited. At least mm -hmm. in this stage of his career. Maybe he'll get better. We we don't know that. But I've seen what Herbert can do. We've seen what Herbert mm -hmm. can do. He and the sky's the limit for, for that kid. He's just in the same division as uh, as um as Patrick Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes. That's yeah. the only thing that's keeping him back. But the sky's the limit for that kid in terms of skill set and, and and what have you and, and abilities. I just think two is limited. I think Flores knew that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it got to a point where um, it became untenable. But I will say this for Stephen Ross. There's a reason why the Miami Dolphins are, have been the Miami Dolphins like under his leadership, right? They barely make the, they don't, they barely make the players. I don't think they, I could almost count the number of times in my hand, maybe a couple of fingers that he made the playoffs under his leadership, under his, his, his ownership. And the fact is that if you fire a guy like Flores, I was thinking at least he's going to have Jim Harbaugh come down and take over, right? But he uh -huh. shut that down immediately in this, in this, in this press conference because, you know, Stephen Ross, for those who don't know, is a Michigan guy. He went to Michigan. He's a big-time donor and a big-time booster and a big fan of Harbaugh's and vice versa. Harbaugh's a fan of his. But he shut that down quickly. So which leads me to say, what, who are you going to fire Flores for? How, how are you going to get, are you going to get a coach that got the most out of his players and had a winning record against Belichick? Are you going to get, are you going to get something comparable to that? I say emphatically, no. 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 But surprise me. I want you to surprise me, Ross. I do. I want you to surprise me. I mean, it's it's like, I, I just answer your Go, go ahead. No, go ahead. To answer your question, mm -hmm. the Dolphins have only made the playoffs once since Ross has become the owner of the Dolphins, and they have had one, two, three, four, five seasons when mm -hmm. they were 500 or better, mm -hmm. two of which were the past two seasons. Yep. So that's three, boys and girls. You do the math. Uh, the ones who, without Brian Flores, but how long has Ross on the team? How many years? Since 2009. So that's 13. Okay. Going on 14. Okay. Um, yeah. So look, I know, I mean, it came down between a black coach and a black GM, which oh, none and, of us and, make well, up. The black quarterback as well. Yeah. And the quarterback. So in, yeah. quarterback of color in this case. So either way, there are not many of us represented out of those three areas. Right. So it's, I think that Flores is going to get a job in the New York minute. I think the Giants will be foolish not to I just not hope to look it, at them. I just hope it ain't the New York Giants. That's my hope. 
<laughs> well, the Giants are looking at my thing. <laughs> oh, no. They're looking at him. But if I were him, if I were, look, if I were Denver, I would hire Flores. Hell, maybe they could get Deshaun Watson. It's a package deal. Maybe. Um, because their quarterback situation in Denver, that's why big reason why Fangio is no longer there. Mm-hmm. Or, I, look, I just, I just want Flores to avoid the Giants. I really want him to avoid Jackson even though they got a stud at quarterback. I think Sean Codd, owner of the Jaguars, is he's one of the clown show down there too. So there are, are there other op- jobs that will open? The Minnesota job is a good job. I think Minnesota's he, job is, is open. The Chicago yeah. job is open, of course. That's another good job. Yeah. And then, like you job. said, Denver, uh, mm-hmm. Jacksonville, and then the other three that we've uh, harped on so much already. Yeah. So, yeah, those, those seven. Yeah, so I think Flores is gonna be fine. So I, because the only play coaches will look and say, "What? The Dolphins let go a guy who has back-to-back winning seasons, albeit didn't call for the playoffs, but still had a winning record against against Belichick. Mm-hmm. Had a defense playing at a high level, brought his team back from the ashes, and we're gonna let him sit unemployed? No." I mean, you look at it like this, right? So, of mm-hmm. course, for those who, who haven't watched Sleazy Sports and doesn't and don't know, um, Coach Scotty, our, our, our co-host, is a huge Dolphins fan. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I know a little bit about the Dolphins enough from listening uh, to Coach Scotty there. Mm-hmm. And listening to him talk about the team over the past few years, listening to him talk about how the defense, of course, has most definitely evolved over the past three seasons under, under Flores. But a lot of things, for them to do what they've done, in my opinion, with a quarterback who still isn't on on par with a lot of other QBs, even though he's had good games, Mm -hmm. but he's also had bad ones, right? Right. Um, They don't necessarily have a consistent running back, but they they tend to run the ball well enough, but they can always get better. Same thing at the the wideout spot, even though um, Waddle, their their, their rookie QB, not QB, Mm -hmm. but wideout, that they just drafted who – has what the most receiving yards in in a, uh, in, a in a rookie season for um God is it uh, uh, for a rookie all of time? I think it is all time. Is that more than Jamar Chase? Is that more than Jamar, I, yards than Jamar Chase? I think it might be, but it's either hmm. way, he has over a thousand yards receiving. Right. So he's had a wonderful year as, as a wideout as a as a rookie. So offensively they don't they don't have it together they can get it together because they have the assets to do so and right. if they can go ahead and get them a coach in there i think they may be able to do something with this with this organization but at the same time it speaks volumes on what uh flores has been capable of doing even though he's been doing it technically one-handed with that defense and um and and, and partially special teams hmm. so yeah if he had an offense how how much better could he have been maybe right. another win or two right and, and that's the thing. And also, our fellow Aggie, Pete Dukes, isn't he a Dolphins fan? Petey is a Dolphins fan as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, he always says, unfortunately, I'm a Dolphins fan. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's a real fan. At least he's sticking by him. I mean, I'll give yeah. him that. I'll give him that. And your boy, Scotty, too. At least he's sticking by him. But I don't know. I don't know if Stephen Ross knows what the hell he's doing. I don't think he does. Um I, I think it hurts me to say this, even though, again, we're underrepresented in the fall, especially from the GM perspective. Mm-hmm. I think that they fired the wrong guy. I think they should have let go Chris Greer. I mean, look, again, he drafted, he did a decent job drafting the periphery. Like, you know, he drafted Walker. Yeah. He drafted a lot of players on defense, young players on defense. He mm-hmm. brought in a lot of players on defense. He just picked the wrong quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> he just picked the wrong yeah. quarterback. So, again, in range we've seen with Tua, he could get better. No one says he, he, it won't get better. I think he has a ceiling. I think his ceiling is much lower than Herbert's. Oh, well, I, I completely agree with you there. But I'll yeah. say this, right? And, you know, whenever I get an opportunity to talk about the Washington football team, I'll do it. Because <laughs> yeah, I've seen this know. movie before, right? Uh-huh. I've seen this movie before. Right. An owner and a GM that likes the quarterback Mm-hmm. More than the head coach. Yeah. Hmm. Where have we seen this before? Well, Robert Griffith the third mm-hmm. over uh Kirk Cousins. Could well, not just that? Kirk Cousins, but one 
Mike Shanahan because Shanahan Mike did not want yeah he didn't want Robert he did. Griffin yeah he he, he like he liked Cousins better than Robert Griffin well, the third he actually liked Russell Wilson better oh that's right yeah that's Kirk the same Cousins. draft that's the same draft yeah, yeah. the yeah. thing was you know he didn't look at him as necessarily a first round pick and mm-hmm. wanted to go elsewhere with the first round fill another hole the need that they had right. and thought that they would probably be able to get him in the second or third round. Yeah, But, of course, the owner still wanted Bob. They took Bob in the first round. And Mike they was traded still up for looking. Him. They traded up. They traded up for him. Yeah, yeah. lost assets and, and traded up for him. The, the, the funny part was Mike was still looking to draft uh, 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 Russell in the third round. It just happened to be that the Seahawks yeah, got around before. to taking him before yeah. Washington had their pick. And that's where they eventually would end up taking Kirk Cousins. Yeah. So, yeah, I've seen this movie before. It's been a little bit messier here, mm-hmm. but it's the same movie. But I'm, I'm going to hope for the, the Dolphin fans there that it turns out better than what it turned out here because well, it got real horrible here. Yeah, and they got – the Dolphins are great fans. I was just watching football team. A lot of tradition in both places. Hell, mm-hmm. people forget – and I'll move on from this quickly, but people forget that the Dolphins in the 1970s, they won the first – they were in the. They were the. They won the first. The the two of the first. I want to say two of the first three Super Bowls. Be, like because, uh, well, the the, the Baltimore the nineteen seventy Baltimore Colts won it all. They beat Dallas. The 1971 Cowboys beat the Dolphins in the playoff in the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Then the seventy two Dolphins, the seventy three Dolphins, they won. So the Dolphins played in three of the first four Super Bowls, nineteen seventy. In the 1970s, yes, most definitely. In the 1970s. Yeah. So if it weren't for a certain team in Pennsylvania. <laughs> that team seems to ruin everybody day. They the could only- have been the team of the 70s. <laughs> yeah, they could have been because they were the first, other than the Packers, after the merger, they're the first mm-hmm. repeat champions. Yeah. And they played in three straight Super Bowls under Don yeah. Shula. So mm-hmm. with quarterback by uh, Brian, but not Brian, but, but, but Bob, Bob Greasy. Greasy. Yeah. So, Hall of Fame. Don't so, worry, we did the same mistake yesterday, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think about some Brian a lot. So, yeah. So, they were, I mean, the Dolphins, they're, they're a story franchise. They were a story yeah. franchise, but, you know, who knows? Um, but, yeah, speaking of the NFL, I, I think there's going to be a little drama in the playoffs, the first round. I think there's going to be a lot of ass whoopings. You got my team <laughs> going to be the, earn the right to be the sacrificial lamb for the Kansas City Chiefs on Sunday night. Um, I you also got some potential blowouts. You got what? Um, I don't have it for me here. Concerned but. about um, Pittsburgh's offense competing the against the Kansas offense. City Chiefs. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, I'm also slightly concerned about what's going to happen between Philadelphia and Tampa Bay. That's another ass whooping. That's another ass whooping. You know, and, and they're sorry. getting Leonard Fournette back as well. So yeah. if he's a hundred percent, even though they don't have their wideouts yet, it's, mm-hmm. it could be a very interesting situation. Um, well, not interesting. It, it might get a little lopsided there in, in Tampa Bay as well between Tampa and Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Um, Dallas and San Francisco. I, I, you know me and how I feel about the Cowboys because I know you feel the exact same way. I do. Um, them, yeah. I think that game could be a lot better than what people may expect. Um, I hope San Fran just wipes the floor of them. I mean, Dallas Cowboy fans are so fucking delusional. I, I just hope, my brother's a big 49ers fan, at least for him, I hope that they just go in there and just beat the snot out of it. I just going to be very close, though. But I just I just hope, I guess, I hope they beat the hell out of Dallas. I really do. In front of the stupid-ass fans, delusional fans on national television, I just, I just want them to just, just break their will, rupture some spleens, twist some knees, step on some <laughs> ankles. I just, I just want Dallas to be embarrassed so bad. But it's probably gonna be bite some kneecaps. Yes. Shout out to the, <laughs> I'll, shout I'll, out to, to Detroit's coach. Yeah, he said that. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be, I'll be nice to Dallas for a brief moment because I mean we basically Why? just gave. No, we, I mean, we basically gave the, the Miami Dolphins credit for doing this exact same thing. And okay. we look like hypocrites if we don't, right? Okay. Because, okay. of course, their, their final, what, three of the, they won three of the last four games um, yeah. with blowouts over 
Washington twice, yeah. and the third string of the Philadelphia the Eagles. Eagles. <laughs> right. and, and yeah, it's the third string, but like we just said, a win's a win. The winner's a win. Yeah. They're pros. They're yeah. supposed to come out and compete. They get paid Unfortunately, too. they couldn't compete. Yep. The thing was, though, against those depleted teams that they did beat, they didn't look up to par playing against a playoff team like the Arizona Cardinals. Right. So I, I question how this team, and then of course a bunch of other teams that they beat this season were non-playoff teams as well. So I'm, I'm, I question how they are going to look against playoff caliber teams, starting with the San Francisco 49ers. And mm-hmm. then of course we move on to Arizona and uh, the, the Rams as That's well. That's going to be a good game. That's going to be a good game, I think. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be good, you know, with, without, um, uh, 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 what's your boy's name, the wide out there. From from Houston formal. Like oh, DeAndre Houston. Hopkins gonna De- be still out. DeAndre Hopkins. He's, I think he's still gonna be out. Oh no. Oh, so yeah, no. if he's if yeah. he's still out, then I don't know um, exactly how competitive that game will be. But it, it, again, these are two divisional foes. Anything yeah. can happen. True. True. And Arizona beat them in LA earlier this year, and LA is, is limping into the playoffs in terms of play. Yeah. So, um, and I don't, I don't know if Jerry Williams is going to fight another free safety on this team, <laughs> but that was hilarious. Well, they, they, they actually did. they did. They picked up um, Waddle. Eric Waddle. Waddle. Eric Waddle. Eric Waddle came and, out of retirement. And that was, just, and that's Jalen Ramsey's boy too. Jalen Ramsey's is excited about that. So yeah. he was on social media hyping it up. So, um, yeah, we'll, 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 like, we'll see. At least he got a veteran presence in, in the, in the secondary. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's, that was still crazy. Um, gosh, yeah, I don't. It's not from a couple of games, man. And I'm intrigued with Cincinnati hosting the Raiders. So am I. I'm I very think that intrigued might about be the that. Matchup of the weekend, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm very intrigued because you got two teams that no one thought would be in the playoffs, right? Another mm-hmm. one team is going to go into turmoil this season. We mentioned it earlier with as far as the Raiders, and then the Bengals went from worst to first. Most definitely, yeah. And I always said about them, if they were always a decent offensive line player away from being scared. They got the mm-hmm. skill position players. They got the defense. They're just young and good. That's the thing. They're young. So, again, if I were the Bengals still, regardless of what happens in the postseason, I would still invest in some offensive linemen out in the draft of free agency. Of free agency. Hell, they, they got the capital to do it. So... Um, but still, that, the sky's the limit with that team. And again, I think, like I told Andre a few weeks ago, we're on the precipice of going back to the future, going back to the 80s. That's mm-hmm. how the Bengals were in the 80s. They were, they were great in the 80s. They were outstanding in the 80s. They're, as good as they were in the 70s, for the most part, except for the last few years of, of, the, of the decade, they were outstanding in the 80s. So I think we're on the, we're on the precipice of going back to that again. So we'll see about that. I'm just, I'm just going to have to pray for my Steelers because we're going to get beat by at least four points. I just, I just, but anyway, uh, <laughs> shout out to Mike Thomas, by the way, for getting that rag tap bunch back to the playoffs. I, it, he should get some consideration for Coach of the Year for dealing with that shit, how it shit this year, but at least offensively. But anyway, also shout out to T.J. Watt for tying the record uh, of Michael Strahan for the sack record. And people like yeah, the Yale bets out there be like, well, actually, it's 17 game season now, so it shouldn't happen. And I'd be like, well, actually, he played only 15. How about that, right? He, he, set that? The, he tied a sack record in less time than Michael Strahan did. Yeah. So true on that, too. Um, so <laughs> hey, but I was one of those 17 game season, uh, 17 game season guys myself. So yeah. yeah. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm talking I'm about you. That I'm talking about yeah, you. Talk about, yeah, I'm true <laughs> on that one. I'm guilty. Anywho, um, college, yes. There was a there was a national championship game that happened, as we mentioned earlier. Georgia gets yes. over the hump, 33 to 18 over the, the hated Alabama Crimson Tide. Bravo to the Georgia Bulldog program. Bravo to Kirby Smart, the head coach, former uh Nick Saban assistant, top defensive lieutenant for years and years and years. And he's building that program the way Nick Saban built Bama. They yeah. all the first and second stringers could start. Well, the second stringers could start on most D one squads, even some more power five squads. You could start for. So that's the, so they're one and two and three deeps. All but rivals Bama's. 
So mm-hmm. Jake is finally going over that hump. I know that Alabama has some in, the injuries in the, in the wide receiver position. Uh, they lost Jameson Williams during that game. Jameson Williams mm-hmm. during that game. Got prayers for him, for him, for that young man to come back healthy uh, sooner rather than later. Um, I think he was, I think he was going, I think he was going to head to the NFL, as a matter of fact. Who, yeah. I got to check on that. It'll be interesting to see how that actually affects his uh, his draft stock. Yeah, so prayers for him. Hope, hope that young brother gets back. Um, you know, the, the, the quarterback, Bryce Young, I think his name is, in, in yes. Alabama. I think he's going to – there are better days ahead of him, before him. He didn't have the, the quite the supporting cast from a skill position perspective as did Tua and uh, Jalen uh, Jalen Jalen uh, Hurts and – uh, Mac Jones. He didn't have yeah. that tracks <laughs> that tracks quad four by four relay team of receivers. So he still got them there. He mm-hmm. still played well throughout the season. It's, it's just this stuff happens. It happens. Mm-hmm. It happens to the best of us. I just think from where the playoffs demonstrated with the two blowouts in the semifinal rounds. I mean, you see, Cincinnati did the best they could. They didn't get completely embarrassed. But still, Alabama's just better. And, and that was a game, that was a master class of line play mm-hmm. in that game. So, and then Georgia, J, Michigan had no business being on the same field as Georgia. So, which is not Michigan's fault. It's just that the, the top dogs in the SEC are head and shoulders better than everybody else in the country. It's just this. And so, with now with this quick, just real quick here, with news of the playoffs being like, Expansion being like table because no one wanted to agree on eight, 12, I heard 16. It is what it is. I mean, it's the SEC's world we're living in. Just as basketball. <laughs> People imagine the SEC is dominating yet again. It's like they did with LSU play Alabama eons ago for the BCS National Championship, which led to mm-hmm. the playoff. So, yeah, it is, it is what it is. And Notre Dame, Stop bullshitting around and join, join the ACC full time. You already, all, the only reason why they still are un, uh, independent, and I'm not mad at them for this, is because of access. They still technically, theoretically have access without yeah. having to join the conference. I'm mm-hmm. saying they should stop bullshitting around and join the conference. If they were in the ACC this past year, they would have been in the playoffs. They would have been in the playoffs because they're better than Wake. They're better than yeah. Pitt. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. They would have been in the playoffs. So I'm just saying. Stop bullshitting around, Notre Dame. Join the ACC full time. You thank your pockets for it. You thank your trophy case. Your trophy case will thank you for it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Could have been, <laughs> you could have been ACC champs again, and it could have been would have been favored to be the ACC champs next season. But that's yeah. not here nor there. Um, speaking of college, let's move on to the HBC sports segment. I'm gonna give it to you eventually, but I want to just pres- I just want to share something with you. Like, there's a group I, t- I mentioned uh, um, on um, in social media called the Squack Sports Central. It's on Facebook. It's a Facebook group that I've laughed about before because it's, a, it's full of petty fans talking petty trash to other S- Squack schools. Yes, there's a few MEAC fans in there, too, which is pretty hilarious. But Actually, right, because I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, there's some MEAC fans in there, too. <laughs> But the but the but the but, but the, the fact of the matter is, it touched upon the discussion we talked about a little bit last week. You know, with Dion picked up that kid Travis Hunter. Apparently, he picked up another kid, a top wide receiver, um, mm-hmm. committed to Jackson State, and he actually flipped a kid—not flipped, but a kid from Florida State that the defensive tackle is transferring to uh, to Jackson State as well. So he and he said. Remember when he got when when he after he got the commitment from Travis Hunter, that he said more is coming. Mm-hmm. He and his coaches have been like more is coming, more and more of this is coming, and which led me to discuss with you about re- HBCs, HBCUs, not just, not just Jackson State, obviously reinvesting in these yeah. programs, not having to be like Clemson, not having to be like Alabama or Georgia, just be, just have re- enough resources. Not only to attract these kids, but to keep these kids. Mm-hmm. Because that's what it's going to boil down to. 
Can you keep these kids? Can they get to the, to the next level at these from these institutions? Because yeah. once they can, and we've seen other kids do it. I've, obviously, Darius Leonard. He's one time the rookie defensive player of the year got a huge contract extension. Mm-hmm. We've seen it happen. Javon Hargrave mm-hmm. from South Carolina State. All these cats from South Carolina State, I ought to tell you something, right? But but also for South Carolina State, got there in the third round by the Steelers, parlayed that to a good free agent contract with the Philadelphia Eagles. We've seen this before, right, yeah. in this day and age. But I think that we, I mentioned last week, that I think the HBCU is on the verge of something, the precipice of something really special. With Eddie George being at Tennessee State, with now Hugh Jackson being in Grambling State, you know, and detracting more from former players of black players, some of which Hall of Famers, we'll get to that in a moment, as well as former black coaches, head coaches in the NFL, to coach the SWAC in, 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 in particular. But there's this one, I mentioned SWAC Sports Central, one guy talked about, now, as far as funding, it's just used funding their, their own programs, right? But he's like, the question is like, he asked, we need to be concentration. He says, he said this first, some of you spend a significant amount of time talking about power five programs. We need to be concentrating on why comparably sized and much newer FCS programs have surpassed or are surpassing FCS HBCU athletic programs. How many of our programs can consistently beat top 10 FCS programs? Good question. There's more. Some of these programs like Kennesaw State, we've, I've heard of Kennesaw State. They were, mm-hmm. I think, in the FCS playoffs this past year. On yeah. even 15 years old. Relatively new. Some of y'all aren't, aren't are worried about why black kids are choosing SEC programs, but ain't asking what draws a kid to Southeast Louisiana which beat down FAMU in the, like a, in the playoffs, Jacksonville State, or Furman. Furman, mm-hmm. they have a history that's not favorable to Black students, but that's another podcast from another time. Over mm-hmm. at HBCU, what makes a kid from Florida choose South Dakota State over Bethune-Cookman, Florida A&M, Grambling, or Southern? And I thought that was a damn good question. So, yes. I mean, I was I was want to just discuss this right quick with you. You could take whichever direction you want, because again, you're close to this, closer to this than I am. Mm-hmm. But it seems to me that we have the alumni support to do better in that regard. Because again, you got Kennesaw State who's less than 15 years old mm-hmm. doing the damn thing in the FCS level. And good for them. Yes. Right? You got Southeast Louisiana doing it. You have Jacksonville mm-hmm. State doing it. Hell, they beat Florida State this past year on the Hail Mary, but still, they beat them. And, you know, we all know about North Dakota State and South Dakota State, right? And J- the James Madison, even though James Madison is going to move up to FBS next season. Mm-hmm. So, and, yeah, we've even watched programs like James Madison, yes. Liberty. Yes, um, Liberty. Yeah. Leave the, F- the FCS ranks and move yeah. up to the FBS ranks, mm-hmm. um, especially as quickly as Liberty has done it. So, um, they got money, lots of money. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and, and you talk about the alumni um, backing the the the, the um, respective institutions, and you know I think we've even touched on the fact of how alumni giving, especially at HBCUs within their athletics departments, right. um, is not that great. Right. Um, one of the differences, though, between HBCUs and, and other institutions, unfortunately, is the corporate giving as well and the mm. donations that they receive, especially if you look at the likes of like a Liberty, right? And the money, because I know all the money that they receive is not from alum. They get their money from elsewhere, yeah. but it's just a bunch well, of uh, people. That, which, which anyway, right? <laughs> the exactly, family. right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you know, you you, you, you get the, the, the places where you're capable of getting your money from and being able to get money not just from your alums and, and, and completely resting on your alumni base. You know, mm-hmm. A&T's alumni base is, is a living alumni base is somewhere around 400,000 and asking for them to give the amount of money for them to, to, to have the type of resources that um, other institutions have would potentially be a stress on all of the alums in order to do so. So yeah, if they can go ahead and start generating money from elsewhere, especially from, from corporate donorships, it would be wonderful. So 
that's a, a, an avenue I know that they've been working on, but they need to go ahead and well, I, I shouldn't say just they, mm-hmm. um, because it's it's it's, it's huh. I I know people love to use what what Deion Sanders has been doing, um, over the past year as an example, right? Mm-hmm. But we have to understand that Deion Sanders is an anomaly. Mm-hmm. I mean, on, on all levels, he's an alarm, anomaly. Yeah. There is not a, I don't care who you can think of. I don't act well. How many people do you think within sports, right? Yeah. That can do what Deion Sanders is doing in terms of being capable of going to be a coach somewhere mm-hmm. and recruit the way that he's capable of recruiting and, and also generating corporate revenue the way that he's capable of doing it too solely based upon of who he is Affleck Affleck um Under Armour um both both like Aff- he's in the Affleck commercial with the great Nick Saban that that tells yeah. you something right there and Under Armour sponsors the athletics at the school too so there's two big ones yeah two right big, and then he entities. also has a situation with where he attracted Pepsi uh to yeah. swag so he's he's an anomaly. There aren't many people on this planet, if anyone else, that can do what he does <clears throat> based upon who he is and the right. and, and the type of celebrity that he is, especially within the sport where he coaches. Because of course he is a all time great in that sport too. Correct. It is very difficult to replicate that any place else. And I find it funny when people try to say, "Hey." Why don't they just do what Jackson did? Ain't no other Deion Sanderses. Let's be real. Eddie oh. George, another all pro, NFL all pro. He ain't Deion Sanders. You no, know, Hugh Jackson, as well as reputation he is as an offensive minded coach, he ain't he Deion ain't Sanders. Deion Sanders. Bubba, Bubba, what's his name? Bubba McDowell, 11, uh, 11 year pro in the NFL. A damn good player, but he damn ain't Deion. Good player. <laughs> he ain't Deion Sanders. Right. Tyrone Wheatley. Tyrone Wheatley played great ball at the University of Michigan. Ten-year vet in the NFL. He, he ain't Deion. Deion Sanders. Yeah. Hell, you know, you can name anybody. I don't care who else you name. Uh, Michael Strahan. He's close, but he ain't Deion. Right. He's close. He's outfitting uh, Texas Southern, his alma mater. Yeah, he's, suits. he's outfit, but, but, but he doesn't have... The the uh, based upon the, the stuff that I've heard him say, he doesn't he doesn't have it in him to be a head coach. Right. Well, Jerry Rice, who is now starting to come out and say that he might want to get in. I'm most I'm gonna miss him. You, yeah, I was gonna miss him. <laughs> Which would be interesting, right? Because I don't yeah. I've, I've never heard him in his interest of wanting to be a coach before. But same thing as Eddie George, but I digress, right? Yeah. You want to go down that road? He wants to reinvest. He wants to reinvest that flag program. He be a Jerry Rice at Mississippi Valley State. His alma mater. He he's, yep. he said that he's been saying that for a long time, and now he's so, so inspired to do so with Dion. Yeah. Yeah. So what does he want to do? Does he want to be an assistant? Because I'm, I like Darby, the, the uh, Darcy, the, the head coach that they had down there now, the young guy. I love him. My hope is that they don't get starstruck and see Jerry Rice, and it's like, eh, let's go ahead and bring Jerry in. Word. Yeah. I mean, I if heard- you do that, I, I'll be hurt. I would. I, I heard also that, and I've heard this on a couple of podcasts, HBCU Central podcast, that um, Ed Reed, they, like, Grambler kicked the tires on Ed Reed. Yeah. And Ed Reed told them apparently no, which is why they got Hugh Jackson. Not that Tate said Hugh Jackson is like a bad consolation prize. Uh-huh. But they, they were going, they were, they were swinging for the fences, apparently, for uh, for uh, for Ed Reed, and apparently Ed Reed does have an interest in coaching, and that's the thing, right? Ed actually has an interest in coaching. Yeah, God, and even as as great as Ed um, was, Hall of Famer himself, he ain't Dion. He ain't Dion Sanders. <laughs> he's Marshall not Falk Dion. too. Marshall Falk wants to coach in the squad. Apparently, he's interested in coaching a squad. He ain't Dion but Sanders. He ain't Dion Sanders. <laughs> and, and, and let me go ahead and correct myself. Uh-huh. Uh, it's Vincent Darcy, not okay. Nancy. So it's Vincent Darcy. Okay. Um, uh, 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 look, did I get that wrong again? It's, it's Dancy, I bet. Let me go ahead I and make sure I get this right. right. I know, right? 
Yes, it is Vincent Dancy. I'm sorry. I, I know I've been saying it wrong. I said it wrong several times. My, mm. Please forgive me, SWAC fans in the Valley State. <laughs> oh, you know, you it's know, it's know, Vincent Dancy, are, most definitely. But yes, up. right? <laughs> I know, right? They're like, oh, this man don't know nothing. He's talking about he's coming, <laughs> he don't cover. I'm sorry. It's Vincent Dancy, right? Mm. Um, but I know one thing. He's a wonderful coach. I do know that. <clears throat> and I know he loves his players. And I know yeah. he wants to continue to develop that team and continue mm. to get them better. And they're going to be dangerous next year with mm. that sophomore QB and, and well, rising sophomore and, and, and that running back that they got, they're going to be dangerous next year. I do know that. But Ed Reed, who does have an interest in coaching, other players that I do know that also have interest in coaching, uh, 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 D- D'Angelo Hall is another pro football player, former mm, pro football player, that has an interest in coaching. But they aren't that celebrity that Deion Sanders is. They Correct. aren't. That, the, the charismatic, in-your-face, Smile the uh, a, a thousand watt bright. <laughs> they not they not Dion. They aren't, and there's no way you can it, replicate. And it's that. not it's not their fault. It's nothing wrong with those guys. It's, it's nothing very wrong great, with those guys. Very great, off great football minds. Huge action. Wonderful Again, football minds. Great mind. offensive mind. Eddie George was a damn good NFL player. And yes. left in the state of Tennessee. Yes. And Bob McDowell was a, he was. I remember him from the AFC Central days. The House of yes. Pain. Yes. Damn good player. He was a yes. pro bowl. I think it was a made all pro. But uh-huh. they're not Deion Sanders. They're not Deion Sanders. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult to replicate that, right? Right. And, and, and I understand it's sexy to uh, recruit these four and five-star players, you know, and, 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 and Channing Crowder, you, you and your apology, you can keep it. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm gonna go, let me go ahead and touch on that just a yeah, little bit too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the, the Pivot Podcast, which touched when Ryan Clark was making the same point, or actually, we, I should say we were making the same point that Ryan Clark and uh, Fred Taylor were making in regards to you got these other coaches, Hugh Jackson's of the world uh-huh. and Eddie George of the world, but they're not Dion. So that was that was that was Ryan Clark's point, which was a great yeah. point. So I'm yeah. glad we touched on that. But 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 uh, but uh, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, even though we do kind of agree on the fact that we don't believe that Deion Sanders is going to be there long. Right. And that's one thing we do agree on. But you know what? Yeah, China, you can still keep your apology. Mm-hmm. And I'm writing an article on that, too, as Uh-oh. well. That's coming out soon. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you can't keep hoping to follow a blueprint that is a one of one. Yeah. Celebrate the head coaches that we currently have. Celebrate the fact that Bubba McDowell has been on that staff. At Prairie View, very uh, Prairie View A and M for a while knows that knows that city, knows that institution, knows those players. They like playing for him. Celebrate that. The right. fact that some Bama asked why didn't Prairie View A and M chase after a, a, the, the celebrity of the likes of of a Deion Sanders so they can have a splash higher? Man, get out of here. Because you know what. Let me tell you who ain't a splash hire or wasn't a splash hire necessarily. That would be one Buddy Pew. Yeah. Been in the league for 40 years. How did that splash hire of Buddy Pew look against Deion Sanders in the celebration bowl? How did that work out? Right. And, 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 and he's to a my damn point, good coach, too. Buddy Pugh is a wonderful one coach. Hell of a coach. One the hell of a puts coach. Up pros, puts up pros, too. So, yes. And yeah. to your point of the guys who went pro, None of them were five star, four star athletes. Correct. They will remind you they came up from the mud, bruh. Mm-hmm. And, and they were capable of turning around when a lot of people doubted them. When a, when a lot of people laughed at the fact that uh, the Indianapolis Colts took Darius Leonard in the second round, they said that was too high. Was it though? <laughs> was it though? Mm. That man was paying dividends. Yes. That the, man was paying defensive dividends. rookie play, rick, defensive rookie player, the rookie of the year rather. Yes, and the quote is not by accident. Uh, not by accident. Not by accident at all. Mm-mm. And to quote Buddy Pugh, he said it before, and I'll repeat him again. The man says some wonderful things and some hilarious things at that too. But it ain't about where you start; it's about where you finish. Right. Even Dion said it. He said, "Dude, I'll take a three star that's a dog over a five star athlete any day." Who's into the glitz and glam? Develop that guy. Yeah, who into yeah. the, the glitz and glam. That was his point to Channing. It's yeah. like all that's all those perks, if they're about that, fine, they could go there. But I want a kid to your like you said, who's a dog, 
who wants to get yeah. it. Of course, right? So, yeah. I mean, yes, it's wonderful. It's great talking points that mm. we're capable of getting four or five star athletes. Again, congratulations, Deion Sanders, for another wonderful recruiting class that you've had that you started out with so far. I can't wait to see what happens um, come February to see. They need more linemen. They need more linemen. They need more linemen. They might not. Yeah, they might not be done. So it, yeah. we'll just have to wait and see exactly what, yeah. what happens with that, right? Yeah. So they, they they've had some wonderful pickups, and I know it's it's great fodder and great conversation, and it's great that that the attention is coming. But yo. Is, you, you don't necessarily need them to win. And we've already seen that, that you don't right. need that to win. Um, and, and the coaches have done it in the past with players that weren't three, four, and five-star athletes that have gone on to win, that have gone on to be drafted into the NFL, and that have gone on to have lengthy careers, that have gone on to be pro bowlers, all pros, and, and eventually Hall of Famers mm -hmm. without being five-star athletes. Hell, you don't believe me? Ask Alabama and that quarterback that they just faced at the University of Georgia. That was a, a former walk-on. Walk yes, it's a walk-on. A walk-on. Five foot ten inches tall, by the way. Played at a JUCO. Yes. He beat a five-star uh, QB over there in, in, in Alabama. You don't need to be a five-star. It's wonderful to talk about. Mm -hmm. My thing is, when you produce, if, if you can go out there and produce, wonderful. But you don't have to be that. And if you have a head coach that can come in and a, and a coaching staff that can develop these guys into that talent and they have a winning team, have a winning organization, there you go. That's what you do. But to circle way back around and get back to your original <laughs> point, right? I know I talked about a whole lot of stuff just then and went a whole lot of directions. I know I did. Just follow me. Follow me. I, hey, people's instinctive path, <laughs> instinctive paths, uh, 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 yeah, they, um, I'm thinking about the tribe called Quest here, so just follow me on this instinctive mm -hmm. path that we're going on here, right? right? So, to this whole point of not necessarily consistently following or chasing after these guys that are going at the power five school, why not try to attain these guys that are going to other FCS programs? And I thought the same thing. I understand there's certain guys that don't want to stay home, they want to get away from home because of the, the attraction of being at home might be too much of a distraction for them. I get that. But my God, they can't, you're telling me that another HBCU is it capable of, of, of drawing these guys in and have them play for them instead of them, not necessarily, because I, I, I kind of understand why they go to the likes of, say, a Montana State, a Montana, a North Dakota State, a South Dakota State, Sam Houston State. Those programs have been winning programs and they're competing for national championships. And I understand that the lore of, of competing for national championship is one thing, right? Right. But going to a city that may be problematic for you as a person of color is very interesting. And yeah, I really Fargo, North these... Dakota. Look, I've never been to these places. Obviously, I would love to visit. I've been trying to tell my, convince my wife to get an RV, rent an RV, so we could travel uh -huh. across the country. That's a dream of mine. But she's like, I ain't trying to do all that. So, because uh, I would <laughs> love to see these seats. I would love to go to Fargo. I would love to go to play. Because I have a I have a homeboy who used to work with at Deloitte right quick. He he went, he was a football player at Montana. Okay. In, in, like in the 90s. So he he picked the, he played against Tony Romo in the playoffs and picked him off twice. That's the ah, okay. Thing. But anyway, uh the point being is that he said, Scott, it's 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 not many of us there. No. But it's what he said is some of the most beautiful parts of the country he's ever seen. He even encouraged me and another homeboy of ours to visit. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just like, to that point, yeah. I mean, I, I, again, I haven't been to these places. I haven't been to South Dakota. I haven't been to any of the, most of the flyover states. Uh-huh. I ain't been to, I heard of Utah is one of the most prettiest, is the most beautiful state, arguably the most beautiful state in the United States. From, from like from a partner of mine who went to uh, Central, to uh -huh. North Carolina Central, but yeah, to to but to to your point and to what this brother's point was on Facebook is how do we lose our kids? These kids from from the South, Deep South, Florida, kids from Mississippi, Alabama, uh, uh, Maryland, uh, the Carolinas, Georgia. How are we losing mm -hmm. our kids with HBCUs in their backyards? to these institutions way in the middle of nowhere. 
they, they, they're sold these pipe dreams. Well, I, I shouldn't call them a pipe dream. I shouldn't, mm-hmm. right? Because I've never been to these institutions. Uh, well, in most cases, it's solely a visit. Yeah. And, and I don't know what it's like to play in those programs. Mm-hmm. But I can, I, I bet I can guess what it's like to play in them cities, though. Right. You know, you, you belong in those cities, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. You know, yeah. Huntington, West Virginia. Yeah. You know, I, I, you start talking about those those Midwestern towns, those small Midwestern towns. Fargo, this and, and you, South Yeah, Dakota. you're talking about these yeah. guys from, from urban cities in some yeah. cases or from deep southern cities right. that end up in places. Um, you know, again, if, if you're built for that and you can handle it, bless you. Right. Right? But I've heard from coaches, from college coaches, and, and various conferences that, that that they a lot of the guys that have decided to transfer from the institutions to come to an HBCU, mm-hmm. where they said basically, you know what, that city won for me, mm-hmm. it, it, you know, and 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 it, 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 it's always interesting that you know again the influence of their parents, the influence of their head coaches, mm-hmm. for them the influence of people who are surrounding them, right. you know, maybe even teammates for right. them to go to these places and, and, and for whatever reason, it, it, HBCUs have, have just been looked down upon yeah. since like the mid to late eighties up until now. Well, well actually we're starting to get a resurgence now, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, it's still a process. Plus George Floyd's murder. In, in, yes. Right. In particular. Yeah. Uh huh, and it's it's still a process, and it's still not all of us yet, right? Right. Until I start to see again, Mississippi Valley states of the world start getting more talent. Mm-hmm. When I start hearing about D two programs like Claflin start getting talent, um, in basketball. When I start hearing about say, like uh uh uh, who else? Kentucky State start getting more talent. When I hear about Morgan State improving, when I hear about programs like that. When I hear about Delaware State adding more talent to that program, when I start hearing that, right, mm-hmm. that's when I'll believe that that this is working for everyone, correct? Not just for a select few, right? Because right now it's just a select few, and it's at small numbers. I want to start seeing it spread, and I want to see it continue to grow for all of our HBCUs. But it, it, uh, I know it's not just the institutions having a hard time uh, selling to these kids. We have to sell to the parents and to these head coaches and to the people who they're, they're, these student athletes are influenced by mm. to make them want to stay and, and, and go to an HBCU as opposed to going to a program. Now, again, I don't, I don't, you know what, if you want to chase a championship, chase a championship. But if you're going to Kent State, <laughs> right, man, you ain't winning no title at Kent State. No, again, free You're ride games. A free ride, yeah, free, free ride. ride, right? No more a free ride, but yeah, I know. Louisiana Monroe, yeah. You ain't winning. You ain't, you ain't winning no games in Louisiana Monroe. That's the real dog. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who, there's a litany of schools. The U- U- UConn oh, football God. program. <laughs> Do I want to keep going down a list of bad programs? I can. But I'm not going to sit here and insult a bunch of people like that. I'm not. I can, though, but mm-hmm. I won't. So, yeah. So, there are a lot of places where, where kids are going because, they're, you know, they're told one thing. And, and, and you know, if they feel so they get a great education there, I don't fault them on that either. Because, again, you know, I always believe student over athlete any day. And that's the way that it's phrased anyway, student athlete, right? Student athlete, yeah. student first. Not athlete, student. Get, yeah. Yeah, right? Even though there's a lot of places where that's the case and it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and in some, in some cases, you're just an athlete <laughs> that's a a product of the state, but I digress. Um, yeah, if you're looking to major in something, I guarantee you there's an HBCU that has that major that you're looking for. Yes. Right? right. Now, um, are, are a lot of things comparable? Maybe not in, in terms of, because that was one of Channing Crowder's um, 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 points in, in why Power 5 schools are better than um, HBCUs, and we all know that there's a huge money disparity, but there's also a money disparity. We are talking about there's a reason for that. programs. There's a reason for that, for that money disparity. Yes. Oh, yeah, there's a huge, huge reason, reason for that. For that. Yes. But yeah, they also make more money than a group of five teams, and they also make more money than the FCS programs. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, I, I'm still baffled on why they're choosing these other schools over the HBCUs. Um, and, and, and whenever I can get a, a truthful answer, cause everything that I just basically spewed out 
maybe based in is, is based in in in, in, in facts. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's still kind of rhetorical because I don't I don't know these kids and their decision on why they're making these these choices. <clears throat> All I'm going off of is, is things that I've been told and, and things that I've seen, mm-hmm. but I don't necessarily know it's fully true for these kids. But I would love to see th- that talent stay with HBCUs, if not with the HBCUs that that are near them where they're from, at least another HBCU that their parent can easily go and see them. Now, well, I, you, you know, they, they asked the question of Pivot Pockets. By the way, check out the Pivot Pockets. For those of you who haven't, they, Fred Taylor, Channing, 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 um, Channing Crowder, Crowder, and Ryan yeah, Clark. and Ryan yeah. Clark broke away from I, of a of a of a I am athlete, which I, is another I, great yes. podcast. So Pivot Podcast is a great podcast in and of itself. So please check them out on YouTube. Those brothers are doing good things, great things. Yeah. But someone asked a question. I think it was Channing asked asked a question, um, uh, like, "Do you see this in drones?" and I agree with Brian Clark and Fred Taylor when they say no. Yeah, it won't happen I, right I now. do too. It's, it won't happen no. right now. I, I, we got, it's realistic. It's not realistic to have these, all these flood of four and five star kids coming to these HBCUs. I think it's going to be like Rome. It's not built in a day. Over time, when some of these kids, would it be the three star dogs who wants to give, who's not moved by the glitz and glam, or the four mm-hmm. and five stars? Who want to? Who want to? Who, who who want that challenge? But yeah, I think if they see that if Travis Hunter balls out under Dion and this wide receiver that they picked up, I I you know I forget the young man's name. I think it's a four star. Um, when they see them ball out at Jackson State and maybe Grambling, maybe Tennessee State under Eddie George, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and Hugh Jackson that Grambling. When they see them ball out, they're like, hey. You mean to tell me we can play well and get noticed here as well? Because one thing with Shannon Sharp would always say, what well, a coach told me here is that Savannah State was about to transfer to the University of Miami, mm-hmm. is that if you can play, they'll find you. They'll find you. They'll find, they'll find you, you if you can play. Yeah. So we'll see. Again, Rome was built in the day. Um, mm-hmm. I'm happy to see the shift. I'm happy to see some of these power coaches at these power five schools get uncomfortable with the yeah. fact that some of these not only in HBCUs, but other smaller schools or on the FCS level, wherever, are, are taking advantage of NIL, using NIL to their advantage mm-hmm. to lure some of these kids, these same kids. You know, because I don't know if you heard that some coaches like, uh, I forget who specifically said, I think it was Kirby Smart and Nick Saban talked about there should be a cap on it. I'm like, oh, they really should. <laughs> but hey. what Dion and company are doing, whether it be in the SWAC or other FCS programs, but still, I think it's sweet that they're taking that, that someone got smart and taking advantage of it. Because mm-hmm. again, like I said last week, like we said last week, NIL is not is all it is 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 just pushing what's been done under the table above board. Yeah, that's all NIL is as yeah. far as like money and whatnot. But mm-hmm. it's going to be interesting to see. I'm excited about it. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, I think about. You know, Buddy Pugh and company too, because he he has an NFL pipeline as well. How that's going to affect colleges from all levels mm-hmm. going forward? I think it's going. I think even eventually, it's going to take a few more years. I think eventually it's going to even the playing field. I think we're going to see some parity mm-hmm. over time due I, to NIL. I really, think oh yeah, that, I really think that's going to be the case. And I think a lot of these power five coaches are shook as hell over. So. Oh, especially the ones that don't have the resources to 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 get NIL to be a benefit to them. Yeah, right. it's a possibility that that they may be having a huge issue with that as of right now. But yeah, but to the whole point, uh, my thing is, okay, do you want to go to Vanderbilt and lose? Yeah. Or do you want to go to Tennessee State and and, and have a, a an opportunity to potentially compete for you? You'll have, a, in my opinion, you have a better chance of competing for a conference title at Tennessee State than you were at Vanderbilt. You trying to tell me that Vanderbilt was win? Uh, you trying to tell me that Vanderbilt going to win the SEC? Really, dog? Mm-hmm. Really? Let me, let me you, ask you. You, you, you can still be in Nashville. Yeah, <laughs> that, Nashville, still is, in Nashville. Still, is a place to hang. Good, great place to hang on Nashville. I'll give you that. Um, again, I'm gonna ask you this. I heard this asked on other podcasts. I'm asking you on here. Mm-hmm. Mitch Deion Sanders earlier. We both kind of 
in the back of my mind, I don't think he's going to stick around for long. If he continues to have the success, I, I, I well, think I'll say this right. It's it's just the the way that um, collegiate athletics is now. Mm-hmm. It's very rare that you get a guy to stay anywhere past five years. Right. I don't uh, uh, unless you're at where you want to be. Yeah. And you're succeeding. Yeah. That's the only way you stay anywhere for mm-hmm. a lengthy period of time. Dion may prove me wrong. But I just don't necessarily see that that, that Jackson State is going to be a long term situation. I now. think the only place to leave for is Florida State. Mm-hmm. That's home, even though they burned his jerseys, even though they still burned his jerseys over flipping of again a, a transfer a defensive tackle, starting defensive tackle at Florida State to go to Jackson State. Yeah, which I oh, think they is, also had a they had a, de- uh, a defensive end transfer from FSU to Jackson State too. There you go. So he still <laughs> burned his jersey as we speak. So yeah. let you know what they really think of Dion. But let me ask you this: even despite all that, say Mike Norvell shits the bed again, uh huh, which is possible. And I know they just gave him a token, not a color token, but a small extension, another year or two. Mm-hmm. Do you think? I don't, again, I don't think Florida State can afford to pay Norvell and keep paying uh, uh, um, the, the brother who's before him. To not coach them. Oh, Jimbo. Yeah. Well, not Jimbo, but the one after Jimbo. You know, the you know, oh, the man from you got the Jimbo. Yeah, that Bama. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, despite all of that, do you think if Florida State comes knocking on Dion's door, mm-hmm. do you think he leaves after the, if, if say, say like again, Nobel is just the bed this season? Do you mm-hmm. think Dion leaves at the two county full county years at Jackson? Man, if you're, oh my, well, you are asking me. Um, I'll say 70 30, yes. Mm-hmm. I'll say 70 30. Because, of course, the, the, one, the one thing everyone loves to bring up is the fact that he's not leaving his kids there at Jackson State. And mm-hmm. we all know they can always transfer. Correct. We see Bama's transfer every day. Yeah. Really. The transfer portal is clogged up yeah. with, with guys that, that looking to make their exodus out. Now I'm still trying to figure out why these guys aren't having found a home yet anywhere. Right. You know, maybe they maybe they want to tell us tell it as they thought they were, right? right. Um, or maybe they just can't find a fit for, for them. Either way, I just find it interesting that they can't seem to, to find a new home. Um, but yeah, they can always transfer. But yeah, I I just think it's I just have a gut feeling based upon. You know, the fact that we talk about it is his alma mater. He is a Florida guy. Yeah. Um, and my God, as many people that are celebrating Dion, there are a lot of detractors in, H- in the HBCU realm as well. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. Yeah. But he, after a while, man, he might get tired of hearing them too. Yeah. You know, and, and, and he's like, you know, I get an opportunity to go back to um, go back home and I can take my kids back with me. Why not? Um, sure. Do I want to see it happen? No, I don't. As, as, mm-hmm. as I don't want to say that. I hope he stays. I hope he will stay I, and build a, a a power down there. Mm-hmm. I hope that's and, what I hope he does, but I, I, that's probably unlikely. Yeah, okay. and and I hope that you know the, the time in which he is here in Jackson, that other coaches and commissioners from HBCU programs are learning from what he's doing. Yeah. You know, and adapting it to, to what they're doing if they see fit. Right. But at the same time, there are other coaches <laughs> who have their own way that's working for them too. See Willie Simmons down in Florida AM. Correct. You know, they were they were one point away from being in a in the celebration bowl this year. Let's be real. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that it's not like they struggling down there. Mm-hmm. Oh, that being fan mu is going to be bananas next year. I mean, it's the they between them, Jackson. I think Grambling's going to be better under uh Hugh Jackson. Yeah. Um, I you know, it's going to be bananas. It's it's going to be bananas next year. That that Western right. Division is going to be insane yeah. next year. Yeah. Um, but who else? And, and then of course you know you you, you got the the schools in the MIAC with Trey Oliver who had a young team who was one win away. From winning the the, um, the the conference title this year, Delaware State, who was basically eight points away from, and well, I'm sorry, six points, well, nine points away in three different games from them winning the, the, their conference title. So, 
these coaches, they have their ways and, and whatever works for them works for them to help them recruit and compete within their respective conferences. The thing is, though, there are a lot of fans who would love to see these teams compete better against out-of-conference opponents. In order to do that, of course, you're going to have to be capable of recruiting talent that's capable of uh, competing against them. But let's be real, their focus within the MEAC and the SWAC is to win their respective conferences, play in the Celebration Bowl, and win the Celebration Bowl. Let that be your focus. Work on that. Do that. And then if they decide they want to go ahead and open up for them to compete for, for um, national championships, then they're going to have to get ready. The fan bases and the institutions are going to have to be ready to not only re recruit this talent, but those, ta those talents, they're also going to have to be capable of retaining that talent. Exactly. So, yeah, they're just, again, the, the, the support <clears throat> of this, fans, and shout out to Brian Smith that actually asked that question in that SWAT group who's actually an Aggie. That's why I laugh when you said that <laughs> um, you got people in the SWAT group who aren't, aren't even SWAC alums, and Brian is one of them. Um, yeah, again, as much as we ask of our institutions to do, mm -hmm. We as alums and as fans of these of these institutions are going to have to equally do as well and, 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 and do our best from our perspective and, and then also do whatever we can to, to get corporate sponsorship too to help these institutions generate the revenue so they can continue to attract um, talent so that they can continue to win. Well said, brother. Well said. Well said. Do you have any other quick news? HBCU, HBCU after, after all, this is the HBCU sports segment. So do you have any news that you can share with us right quick, bless us with? Oh, yeah, real quick. I want to most definitely go ahead and shout out Isaiah Land, the linebacker, outside linebacker from Florida a and who is this year's Buck Buchanan Award winner. For those oh. who are unfamiliar, on the FCS level, not only do they have their own Heisman Trophy, uh, which is the Walter Payton award oh. you know they also have defensive player of the year which is the buck buchanan award uh the 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 freshman of the year which is the jerry rice award and coach of the year which is the eddie robinson award yes it's ironic that all four of those awards oh, are named for HBCU. HBCU, <laughs> HBCU alums yeah. Yeah, and yeah. it is very rare that you can get at least if one hbcu player to mm -hmm. win at least one of those awards this year we had three win their respective war, war, awards in their respective categories, with Shador Sanders being named freshman of the year and Deion Sanders being named coach, uh, of, coach the of the year. And then Isaiah Land, like I said, from Florida a and getting defensive player of the year. And this is the first time I think we've had um, HBCU players win, it in, win an award in consecutive seasons hmm. with Jordan Lewis winning the award during the spring and now you got Isaiah Land winning it in the uh in the fall. And then of course the list has come out for the um the HBCU combine. Now again, Deion Sanders, I completely agree with you. I I I'm I, I, when you said it at first I was like I, I I questioned it, but now I'm starting to agree. Dude, all you're doing is adding what somewhere between three to five more players at each position to have HBCU athletes actually participate at the real combine, well, I shouldn't say the real, but the NFL combine in Indianapolis in late February. But the Reese's Senior Bowl is hosting the HBCU combine later on this month. And they have about 40 players that they got that's going to be there. Players that include, of course, QB's Akil Glass from Alabama a and um, uh, 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 Felix Harper from Alcorn State, uh, ja Jawan Carter from Norfolk State, uh, the Southern QB, Ladarius Skelton, um, Jamaine Martin from North Carolina a and and um, another guy to look out for, Jerry Garner, our outside linebacker out of Mississippi uh, Valley State. So there's going to be some guys there to keep your eye out for um, that – Hopefully, we'll get an opportunity. Trey, Trey Gross, who's a huge wide out, 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 out of Delaware State, about 210, 220. That dude is a target. He has an NFL-sized body. It's going to be interesting to see how he actually does in this combine and, and whether or not uh, more people um, 
to start to take notice of this guy because they, they may or may not have had not a lot of opportunities to, to see him play. But again, wonderful that you have this HBCU combine. Yes, it is. But yo, they could have opened up like an, an, an additional three or four or four or five slots um, per position sure. at the NFL combine to have those guys participate there, especially with the guys who are who are going to end up not going to the NFL combine anyway, who are going to want to participate on their own pro, pro days. You can very easily have those guys just go to Indianapolis and do that for them. Right. But, you know, <clears throat> baby steps, right? right. So I, I'll take this for now. But yes, NFL, it would be wonderful if you would just go ahead and open up. Because it's five more slots. Five more slots. It's not that hard to do that. Blah, blah. Just open up the five <laughs> more slots. And, and then, of course, um, you know, basketball season is going on right now. Shout out to the Aggies who just got a big win um, over Hampton, over conference uh, rival Hampton just now. Mm-hmm. I, I saw the, the messages pop up on my iPad while we were doing the show. You know, all the Aggies bragging about tonight's game. Um, I'm trying to remember, is there anything else that I may have missed? Um, I think that might be it. Well, oh, yeah, shout out. I, I need to do get the complete list of, of HBCU athletes that are going to be participating in the playoffs. But that list most definitely includes Brandon Parker, offensive lineman that plays with the, the, the Las Vegas Raiders, who actually started. Sunday night against the Chargers. Hmm. He's, of course, North Carolina a and alum. And then, of course, Matt McCain III, the cornerback who's also um, the grandson of Franklin McCain of the a and four, who plays for the Philadelphia Eagles. Hmm. He is also in the playoffs. So congratulations to those two Aggies. To, right. um, and, and then, you know, the other HBCU athletes who are going to be participating. I'll make sure I put out that full list for everyone to, to, to take, um, to watch, or who to watch for. And then, of course, um, a Randolph Ross because indoor track season has begun as well. Yes, it has. He is on the list for the Bowman Award, which is the best um, collegiate track athlete of the year award. So he is most definitely a candidate for that. So, um, well, not a candidate. He's on the watch list for that. So mm-hmm. um, congratulations to that gentleman there for that. So that's all I got for you this week. Cool, man. Thank you for that. Thank you for us with that. And thank you all for tuning in to the nice Clown Out Podcast. Please check out the Wayne Nash's great work on the RSSP Sports. See the website on this backdrop there. We're asking about all things to see sports. Sleazy Radio every Tuesday on Facebook Live. HeroSports.com. We talked about all things FCS and Flex. Change HBC Sports. That's me. www.theclowntimes.net. You see the sports blog there. Please continue to subscribe, like, comment, and share. That's what I want y'all to do. I'm going to put this out. I love you, HBCU, fellow HBCU sports fans. I have a lot to say on here as well. So, hey, I'm going to put it out there as well. I enjoy the back and forth. I enjoy the comments on Facebook. So, again, like, comment, and share. Also, get the merch, cafepress.com. Get that merch. <laughs> Search for the Cloud Tire Sports. Again, all the links that I gave you earlier, Dwayne's links and my links, both my links will be in the description on this, on this video tomorrow. We upload it to Facebook. So until then, enjoy the NFL playoffs. Stay your ass warm. Please continue to wear masks because the Omicron is a, is, 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 is a son of a bitch. But just stay safe. <laughs> Peace out. Until next time.